So, this is a very beautiful technique. For those of you who haven't experienced silence in your mind yet, you can follow this technique. Guaranteed to stop your thinking. What you do is it's called watching the space between thoughts. In just the same way, when you come into this room, you just see the objects in this room. But very rarely do you notice the space which surrounds us, which connects us all, which embraces us. And in this hall, there is actually more space than there are things. But why is it that we only notice the objects? We never notice the space. It's just a psychology, that's all. Now, when you are watching your mind, why is it we only notice the objects in the mind? instead of the space in the mind. By the objects in the mind, I mean your thoughts, your concepts, the names. That's all we notice. But actually, in your mind, there is a lot of space as well. There is silence, but we don't notice it. We don't recognize it. That's why we think it's not there. To emphasize this point, I want you to be mindful in the next minute or two, to listen not just to what I'm saying, but also listen to the content of your mind. When I am speaking like this, what's happening inside your mind in the gap? between my words. <laughs> when you were waiting for the next word, what was happening inside? You were silent. Because you were waiting for the next object to arise in your mind. You didn't know when that object was. When you were listening to the gaps between my words, you were silent. It's not that hard to be silent. You see, it is always there. Now, what you do in meditation is you <laughs> you do silly things like that, but with your thoughts, you listen when a thought, when an idea, when a name finishes. And before the next thought begins, you see that space the space between your thoughts. Before, you may never have noticed that. You think it was not there. You think you were thinking all the time. Just like when you come into this room, you think there's just people in here, not space. But, once it's pointed out to you, yeah, there is space between your thoughts. There are many moments of silence when one thought is finished and the next thought has yet to begin. Now what happens when you start noticing that silence, when you get a feel for it, when you are familiar with it, not only do you notice it, you recognize what we mean by silence, but quite naturally you'll find that silence grows. What you notice grows. And as you notice the space between the thoughts more and more, you see that space expanding. You are silent for more and more moments. First of all, you realize, yeah, I can be silent. You realize what it is, and you see it growing. It's as if the silence crowds out all of the words. Just the same way when you notice the space in this room. It crowds out all the things. As your mind sees space, Emptiness, silence. So those of you who have trouble with a thinking mind, who sometimes you expect your mind to be crazy, see if you can notice the space between your thoughts. And then silence will grow. And in that silence you'll get amazing peace. It's easy to do. It's just changing your perception. Not changing the object of your consciousness, changing the way you look at it to see the space rather than things. 
Any questions about that before we go on to the first question of today? Any questions from the floor or from the cushion? You're not on the floor, you're on the cushion. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put my glasses on to give me vision. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Number one question is today. Oh my goodness, it's an essay, not a question. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, I have a Catholic friend who is practicing Anapanasati on her own. She has shared with me that she has seen very bright white and purple lights, which she now gets easily. She also said that the joy she experienced can compare to none she has experienced in her daily life. I believe she has seen a nimitta and urged her to get a meditation teacher, but she said that her faith is God, in God is strong and she does not want to be converted to be a Buddhist. Now, how should I further advise her? If she comes to me, I will promise her I will not convert her. (laughs) Why are people so afraid of being converted? They are, you know, and this is why. When we first built our monastery in Serpentine, in Australia, 21 years ago, all we had was like a, a small wire fence around the property. It was in the countryside and we were afraid of burglars. Because we had lots of building equipment there and other stuff, we hadn't got proper buildings yet. So, I was asked to put up a sign on the fence, trespassers will be prosecuted. And I thought, no, that won't stop anybody. So I changed the sign to trespassers will be converted. (laughs) And no one came in. (laughs) People (laughs) People are more afraid of being converted, they know of being prosecuted. Just like your Catholic priest. <laughs> okay, eventually, like Christians will realize they can be friends with the Buddhists, they've got nothing to fear. The mind is the mind is the mind. And they should come and get some good, decent advice on what to do next. So, how should I further advise her? Tell her that he can come to the Ajahn Brahm, he promises, crosses his heart, hopes to die. Because I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> that I will not convert her. She also has a concern that in the event of a fire, etc., when she is experiencing one of the out of body experiences, it's not actually out of the body when you get these limiters, it's in the body, in the mind. Would her body be burnt and would she be able to get back into her body? Thank you. Why does she want to get back in her body? If she's a Christian, she's going to God. The quicker she gets there, the better. So ask her, what are you worried about? And they're worried because even though they believe in one thing, in their depth of their heart, they don't fully believe it. So much for faith. It's superficial. If you really had faith, then you wouldn't ask that question. But some of you might think the same. If you're sitting in deep meditation and there's a fire, what would happen to you? Many years ago in the time of the Buddha, this happened when there was a monk sitting in the jungle in deep meditation. So deep was his meditation that when two villagers were going into the forest to get some plants and some firewood, they saw this monk sitting so still they thought he was dead. Being devout Buddhist villagers, they thought it's not appropriate to leave a dead monk like that to be eaten by the jungle animals. So the religious duty meant that they had to collect some firewood, make a pyre and put the monk on top. (laughs) Which they proceeded to do. And having made the pyre and put the monk on top, they lit the funeral pyre. When the flames were very strong, they were very busy villagers. They couldn't hang around the funeral all day So they thought, we've done our job, the fire is strong enough now, it will all be burnt. Then they went off to do their jobs in the the forest. Now you can imagine what they felt like the following morning when the monk came in for armed food. (laughs) Not even his robe was burnt, let alone his skin. When you get into these deep meditations, there's some magical things happen because the mind is so strong. Or maybe the devas protect you, I don't know, but certainly 
in those deep meditations you become almost invulnerable. This is what happens. So you don't need to be afraid at all. There's an Indonesian monk I used to know. He had very powerful samadhi as well. And he told me that once he was in the forest, in somewhere in Java, he went deep into the forest to get some seclusion. He got into a very deep meditation, which lasted literally for days. When he came out of his meditation, he noticed from the marks on the trees that there had been a flood. The water was way above his head. He checked with the villagers, yes, there had been a huge flood during the days he was meditating. Completely immersed underwater for many, many hours. He didn't know a thing and he was perfectly okay. That's a recent story. So you don't have to worry at all. If you're sitting in deep meditation and there's a fire, probably what will happen, the firemen will go in there, they get all the rubble, this, that, and then they find you there. They say, oh, is this amazing? He's still alive. So you can tell your Catholic friend that story. And tell him, if you don't believe me, come and see Ajahn Brahm. But he promises he won't convert you. <laughs> loving kindness is loving a person for who they are. If you try and convert someone, it's called hatred. I hate you being a Christian. I hate you being a Buddhist. I hate you being a Hindu. I hate you being a Muslim. Therefore, I want to convert you. That is not loving kindness. That's hate. But Ajahn Brahm, nothing is something. Please share the concept of God in Buddhism. Is there a God after nothing? How does Buddhism relate to other religions since most are God-centered and Buddhism is a way of life? Thank you. With metta, a no vice. We say that to people in the interview rooms. A novice means one who has no vice. So if you're a novice, you're one who has no vice. <laughs> so nothing is something, and something is nothing. So anyway, uh, please share the concept of God in Buddhism. Okay, there, even in Christianity, there's heaps and heaps of different concepts of God. For, especially in Christianity, for 2,000 years they've been arguing what God is, what God isn't. And because of that, there is no static concept of God. For those of you who are interested in this idea, there's a, a modern writer called Karen Armstrong who's actually written many books on the different religions. She's very popular these days. And if you go to the airport, you see you know, she's got a book on Buddhism, on Islam, and all sorts of other religions. But she made her name. She was actually uh, she was a nun, a, no, a Catholic or Anglican nun, when she was very young, but she left because she thought the, the order of nuns was, um, hadn't really grown with the times, hadn't really adapted, and wasn't relating to real life. But she still kept up her, her very deep interest in religion, and also I think she did a, a degree in English at Oxford. And she made her name by writing this book called A History of God. A History of God. And it's a great book because she started looking at the concepts of God throughout the ages and throughout the different religions. And how even in Christianity that concept has changed and it keeps on changing. If you read at the very earliest uh, levels of, say, Christianity, that God is a very angry God. He says, I get angry every day. He's a fearful God. And later on, that changed to being, like especially in the New Testament, like a loving God, a forgiving God. And that's just an example of how the concept of God changes. It started off with being a creator with a big white beard who actually started things off, but as science became prominent and dominant and actually managed to say, well, you can't have such a creator God because you know, science and it's so strong, the evidence is so compelling, that the original concepts of God in the Bible just are untenable. So because of that, that we've had all sorts of different concepts of God. I mentioned one of those a few days ago. In Psalms, which is in the Christian Old Testament, there's a very beautiful saying there, to be still and know, know that thou art God. That's a fascinating, it's in the Christian Bible, because that gets very close to what we do in Buddhism. We're being still. That's samadhi, samatha, stillness, letting go, being mindful, knowing is being mindful. So when you get deep inside, what do you know? 
It's obviously, it's not sort of a creator outside. When people say, in Buddhism, what created the universe? What's the cause? Why did this universe begin? And you can answer from what the Buddha said. The origin and end of this universe is to be found in this fathom long body with its mind. Sanyuta Nikaya Rohitasa Sutta. Now that's actually where we get a much more reasonable idea of creation. Not a creation sort of you know, thousands of years ago. Actually, modern science puts it about 13,000 million years ago when the Big Bang was. But even modern, modern science, the work of Ralph, was it Ralph or Raoul Epstein and his partners with multidimensional uh, planes colliding, and when they meet, that's another Big Bang. A serial set of universes he was proposing according to the physics, and it was such a very good theory supported by masses of evidence that that was the uh, current theory of our universe. It's not a single universe, it's not one universe created once, but serial universes, one after the other after the other, just as in Buddhism. So because of this, the idea of a god as an ultimate being is more in, in line with you know, who is the creator inside of you to actually to find out the origin of things within you. But whereas many theistic religions have an idea of a God living in a sacred text, in other words, believe it, don't find it out, Buddhism and modern Christianity, which is you know, the contemplatives in the monastic religions and also the great some modern philosophers of Christianity, they all look for a much deeper idea of a God. Not the old God which you have to worship, but a God in the sense of a truth. God in the sense of like a love. And you see, modern Christians say God is love. So if God is love, does that really uh, meet the idea of God creating hell and punishing people? You've already heard enough about love from Ajahn Brahm to know that love is absolutely forgiving. It can't punish anybody. The worst it can do is give you 50 strokes of the cat. <laughs> so how can a supreme being have a sort of love which is less than that it is impossible so the idea of our God is actually changing and it always will change it's not an absolute because of that but it is an absolute in the sense of an underlying essence of things an origin of things that type of God is equivalent to Dhamma because Dhamma means the truth, the origin, the source of things, where things come from, the law. So you can say Dhamma is love. Dhamma is freedom. Dhamma is peace. That word Liba, German word for love. Liberality, giving. God is giving. And liberation, freedom. So we don't need to use an old concept of many thousands of years ago. A fierce warring, male God. We look upon an essence. Not a being essence, but a truth. Dhamma. And if there is such a God, where do you find it? You find it in the heart of the lotus. Right inside of you. Be still and know that thou art Dhamma. Okay? That's a very interesting way of doing it. So we have, I have great conversations with um, Catholic priests and Catholic uh, monks about the nature of God. It's only the evangelicals who were just stuck 2,000 years ago like dinosaurs. <laughs> the Ajahn, if the final attainment is emptiness or nothingness, a jewel in the heart, then why are we in existence? Did we come from nothingness? Okay, the reason why you're in existence is actually to see that, to find it, because you're deluded. You came from delusion. That's where you came from. That's where you were born, in delusion. Awija pachaya sankara. From delusion, dependent origination. There we have all the mental formations and consciousness. That's dependent origination. So the final attainment is actually seeing it's not absolute emptiness because this is a great teaching of the Buddha, Kachana Gota Sutta. What led to the Majjhima philosophy of Nagarjuna 
He said, you can't say there's nothing. 